In November of 2020, while approaching the crescendo of a period of extreme psychic tension, I stood in a little cottage where I'd been many times, and I began an attempt to make contact with an angel. It wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last, and I believe I succeeded. It began in the evening of the 11th day, and what there took place lasted from about 7 o'clock until sunrise. During this experience, I received a message and instructions regarding its purpose and dissemination. I would not ask anyone to simply believe what I say, or to believe anything that I believe. People who say things like this should be subject to the ultimate scrutiny. Most of them are liars, some of them are mad, and if I am neither, I may well be something worse. Do not let yourself be easily convinced. Try not to believe me. No wise person would uncritically accept the things I will soon tell you. I will ask nothing of you, except that you look at what I'm looking at and see what you see. With that out of the way, let's begin. At the center of my contact with the occult is this figure, Abraxas, the great archon of the Gnostic teacher Basilides, who taught in Egypt in Alexandria in the early 2nd century AD. We know rather little about Basilides and his disciples, and only a trace of Basilidean doctrine has survived, because the Alexandrian mystic was a heretic, and his ideas were condemned by the church. Consequently, Abraxas is cloaked in speculation and mystery. It is a remarkably strange fact that its likeness appears on this seal. It's the seal of a Grand Master of the Order of the Knights Templar, who was likely born more than a thousand years after Basilides. It appears within the inscription Secretum Templi, or Secret of the Temple. By the temple, we can presume they meant the Temple of Solomon, given that the proper name of that order was Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. Now the Knights Templar were also condemned as heretics, and accused of idolatry and sorcery. The origin of the name of Baphomet were the accusations made against the Knights Templar. Now this is interesting to me, because Abraxas and Baphomet are symbolically resonant. In the image of Baphomet produced by Eliphas Levi, Baphomet is depicted as unifying pairs of opposites. Written on the creature's right arm is the word solve, and on the left, coagula. These words mean dissolve and coagulate, break apart and put back together. We might then say that Abraxas and Baphomet though rarely used with the same intent, are depicting the same idea. Abraxas is, like Baphomet, a hybrid image, and it depicts in itself a duality and a unifying center. Both figures have also been represented as amoral. The goat in the Christian tradition often represents sin and Satan. In Matthew, Christ says that he will come again to separate the sheep and the goats that he will set the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The right is a position of favor, and consequently those on the right inherit his kingdom and those on the left are condemned. The origin of the goat symbolism goes back to the biblical scapegoat, a goat onto whose head the sins of the people are put. The goat is then expelled into the desert. Now, it's interesting to me that Baphomet has, again, the head of a goat. If we grant Levi the benefit of the doubt and the symbolic literacy he obviously possessed, then we could draw no conclusion except that this is a very strange design choice. Like Baphomet, Abraxas is often associated with the demonic. Catholic demonologists would eventually classify the Gnostic god as a demonic spirit. This is likely because, not knowing much about it, they concluded that something by that name apparently led certain people away from the true church and filled their heads with false ideas about the Savior. 
this Abraxian sect would eventually die, illustrating the point that these people were lured into some kind of dead end, that they were led onto a path that didn't go anywhere. Except it did. Because evidently, and we know not how, some remnant of whatever they believed was to be the inheritance of the Order of the Temple of Solomon. And all of this I discuss to give context to their condemnation. We are simply too late to judge the Order more benevolently. We know that their confessions were extracted by torture, and it's evident that the King Philip who accused them had much to gain by their destruction, at least in theory. Unfortunately for him, shortly after he let Jacques de Molay be burned at the stake, he died, as did his heirs, as did the Pope who let him do it. I am not among the people who think these things random. To consider only one side in all of this is a mistake. I'm sure we're all very aware that one-sided stories are notorious for being inept depictions of reality. Faced with two accounts, we usually choose which one to believe reflexively, and it says more about us than it does about what is. Abraxas is, in the end, a two-sided figure. That it produces two-sided stories about itself should surprise no one, and to take one side is to fail to account for the totality which it itself depicts. In my opinion, the problem with the Baphomet symbol is that what it seems to imply is that the will which unifies opposite forces reigns supreme over reality, with nothing to subordinate it. One could say I am making that up, but it is what the people who like this symbol often seem to believe. Images speak their own language, and what is said about images, even by their creators, is often not a faithful translation. Abraxas, being a human figure who unifies opposites, who was imagined as a ruler of the cosmos, and who is connected with Alexandrian magic, could be used in a way which would mean the same. This is why in the work I've made which features the symbol, there is something above it. You can't see what it is, but it's there. This piece, which I call my Cosmogram, was made in the summer of 2020. I made it over the course of a week, working ceaselessly and scarcely eating. During that week, I slept on the floor beside the desk where I was working on it. And while I did, I could hear a voice in my head dictating instructions. At the end of its creation, the work contained hidden imagery, which I had not put there. A pentagram, an ankh, the Kabbalistic worlds, and even the basic structure of the Temple of Solomon. Then I discovered that somebody else had made an almost identical image four years earlier. The resemblance far surpasses what I would expect of mere coincidence. The appearance of this Gnostic deity is strikingly bizarre. Two snakes for feet, and the head of a rooster. Its name has seven letters, whose sum in Greek isopsophy is 365, both the number of days in a week and in a year. This helps explain why Carl Jung believed Abraxas was a time god. Jung wrote of Abraxas, just as this archetypal world of the collective unconscious is exceedingly paradoxical, always yea and nay, that figure of Abraxas means the beginning and the end. It is life and death. So Abraxas is really identical with the Demiorgos, the world creator. The Demiorgos, or Demiurge, is a concept in Platonic philosophy which refers to the intelligence which governs the material world. The demiurgic world creator is often symbolically identified with the planet Saturn, whose namesake is likewise a god of time. However, there is another angle to Abraxas, and it helps make sense of this alien appearance. The rooster is one of the symbols of the god Hermes, the Greek god of messengers. He was a god of trickery, wit, 
and communication. Another of his symbols was the caduceus, a magic staff entwined with two snakes. Hermes was called Mercury by the Romans, and the same was the name they gave to the planet closest to the sun. Abraxas is therefore, to some degree, a symbolic synthesis of Saturn and Mercury. When I first began thinking about it, I looked at Carl Jung's characterizations. He is the monster of the underworld, a thousand-armed polyp, a coiled knot of winged serpents, frenzy. He is the hermaphrodite of the earliest beginning. Abraxas speaketh that hallowed and accursed word which is life and death at the same time. Abraxas begetteth truth and lying, good and evil, light and darkness, in the same word and in the same act. For me, this description was reminiscent of Azathoth, the blind idiot god of H.P. Lovecraft. Although Lovecraft never said this, Azathoth is popularly imagined as a sleeping god who is dreaming the cosmos into being. This idea is apocryphal, but apocryphal ideas do not arise nor circulate without reason. Azathoth is indeed associated with dreams. He first appears in Lovecraft's Dream Cycle, a series of stories about the dreamlands, an alternate plane of existence which can only be accessed when dreaming. The first work to mention Azathoth is unfinished and is simply titled Azathoth. The only hint as to the origin of this name is the first recorded use of it, a note written by Lovecraft for himself, which reads simply, Azathoth, hideous name. The plot summary for Azathoth on Wikipedia reads, The story begins by describing how the modern world has been stripped of imagination and belief in magic. The protagonist is an unnamed man who lives in a dull and ugly city. Every night for many years, the man gazes from his window upon the stars, until he comes over time to observe secret vistas unsuspected by normal humanity. One night, the gulf between his world and the stars is bridged, and his mind ascends from his body out into the boundless cosmos. The name Azathoth is interesting. On the one hand, it bears some resemblance to Azazel, a fallen angel depicted in the Book of Enoch. Lovecraft mentions Azazel by name in the Dunwich Horror. Azazel was one of the leaders of the angels called the Watchers, accused by Enoch of giving humanity knowledge of weapons and ornamentation. The Book of Enoch reads, Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony, and the beautifying of the eyelids, and all kinds of costly stones, and all coloring tinctures. The whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. Bearing in mind this latter assertion, it is interesting to note that Azazel was associated with the rite of the scapegoat, which was mentioned before. And just like the scapegoat, it is Azazel who is blamed for the sins of human beings. At the command of God, the archangel Raphael was sent to bind him hand and foot, to cast him into an opening in the rough and jagged rocks, where he is to abide in darkness until the coming of the Day of Judgment. The Enochian account is describing a figure very reminiscent of the titan Prometheus, who, after giving fire to humanity, was punished by Zeus and bound to a rock. The pagans held Prometheus in high regard. His name comes from the Greek word for forethought. It was even said that humanity was fashioned by Prometheus. By contrast, the Book of Enoch vehemently despises the angel Azazel, who is to be cast into the fire at Judgment Day. Once again, we find a story with two faces. Let's return to Azathoth. This idea of a sleeping god Dreaming the universe is how I have always conceived of Abraxas, a sleeping demiurge whose dream is our reality. And this conception is reflected in the symbolism. Saturn is the artificer of the world, and Mercury the god of sleep and dreams. Although it is doubtful that Lovecraft knew this, the name Azathoth 
consists of the words Azoth and Thoth. Azoth is the name in alchemy for the universal solvent, the agent of transmutation, and it was symbolized by the caduceus. On the other hand, Thoth was the name of the Egyptian Hermes, the god of wisdom, messages, and magic. Thoth was the legendary author of the Emerald Tablet, a hermetic work which was held by the alchemists to be the foundation of their art. It is interesting that Azoth and Thoth both have a strong relationship with alchemy, especially in light of what was said of Azazel, who again made known to humanity the metals of the earth and the art of working them. Based upon this symbolic constellation, I have imagined Abraxas as the spirit of humanity, a sleeping god entombed in his own dream, who lives a slave to his illusions, who could work miracles if only he dared to awaken. When he is asleep, he summons the devil, but when he awakens, he is Christ. Thus, his name resembles Abracadabra, which means, I will create as I speak. From this, we can understand the connection between Abraxas and Solomon's temple. As according to Jewish tradition, the temple was erected at the same site where God created Adam, the name of whom means humanity. My poem, Reflection in the Grail, was conceived as an invocation to awaken this sleeping God. Its three concluding lines are directed at the reader, who is called on to perceive his or her own reflection in the world. This is why I have said that my cosmogram is a mirror. I find it interesting, therefore, that according to the Book of Enoch, mirrors were likewise given to humanity by the Watchers. It was said that Enoch, who was the grandfather of Noah, lived for 365 years before his ascension to heaven, and 365 is the number of the name Abraxas. Those of you who watched my Logos video may remember this symbol, which I used to advance a theory about how perception works. Though I didn't know this at the time, if you take this clip, mirror it, and superimpose it on top of itself, then let it play, eventually, you get this. The Unicursal Hexagram. Though this glyph is widely recognized as a Thelemic symbol, it actually predates Aleister Crowley's use of it by several centuries. The shape was, as a matter of fact, discovered by Blaise Pascal, a mathematician, inventor, philosopher, and theologian. Pascal found that if a hexagon is arbitrarily inscribed on a conic section, the pairs of opposite sides will meet at three points which lie on a straight line. No matter how you arrange the six points, these three intersections will always be aligned. In all of my work, alignments of three have been a consistent recurring theme. Triple numbers, the cosmic triad, the tria prima, the solar eclipse, the great conjunction, and the belt of Orion. That last one has a terrestrial counterpart in the pyramids of Giza. This fact is rather interesting, as the universal hexagram is often used to symbolize the hermetic maxim as above, so below. If you watched Contact 2020, you'll remember that the solar eclipse was the central recurring motif in my visions, and that I eventually concluded that December 14th, 2020, the date of the nearest solar eclipse, would be a significant one. In November of that year, I was instructed to make a video during the angelic conversation which I mentioned before and to upload it on that date. This alignment of the Sun and the Moon preceded the alignment of Saturn and Jupiter by seven days. I don't know how many people are aware of what happened on the day of that eclipse, but it was in the news, and even I didn't catch it. They said that it was good news, but unfortunately, you can't trust the news these days. Suffice it to say, that the wrath of God 
was poured out from that eclipse, just as I predicted. But I will not be deceived into saying more than that. You may also remember that when I spoke with that angel in November, and was instructed to make that video, I was told, the pyramids will be the proof. That in some way, the pyramids would verify the truth of all that I had said. But although I presented a wealth of mysterious and impressive facts about the largest of the three, even I was not satisfied that I had given proof. Evidence, certainly, but not proof. But I was not told that I would prove it right away. I was only told that the pyramids would prove it. And today, they will. The last time I spoke about these structures, I discussed them in relation to Alistair Crowley. And seeing as we've come to them again through Pascal's hexagram, perhaps he is significant to us. If it must be said again, I am not a Thelemite, nor am I very fond of Thelema. However, I've said to a few friends of mine that I see Thelema as a decapitated version of the same philosophy in my work, that the two systems bear some philosophical resemblance to each other, and that there is a certain resonance between them. However, my ideas find their symbolic head in Christ and the spirit of Christianity. This can be seen in the fact that the head of Abraxas represents Christ in my cosmogram. Thelema, by contrast, has no such authority. It has only the crowned and conquering child, who is a kind of empty vessel onto whom almost anything can be projected. Because of this choice of words, decapitated, it gave me pause when I discovered that the bornless ritual, which Crowley performed inside the Great Pyramid of Giza, was originally called the Headless Rite. And it begins with these words, I summon you, headless one. This is a ritual from the Greek magical papyri, an ancient relic of Alexandrian magic. In the Greek, the name translated as headless one is akephalos. It wasn't clear to me who this figure was supposed to be. In a few places online, I found poorly substantiated assertions that it was Osiris. My intuition agreed, but the claims failed to assure me. However, I eventually found out that among the Egyptians, Osiris was the constellation of Orion. I brought all of this to a friend of mine, who then pointed out that the constellation of Orion doesn't have a head. And if you look at it, you might just notice that it resembles something we've been talking about. A certain figure which was engraved upon an ancient Gnostic gemstone. This stood in front of me, staring me in the face for two years, and in the end, it wasn't even me who found it. I think it's fitting, and I think it's better that it took this long, and I think it makes perfect sense of the final lines of the invocation, which read, I am the headless one with sight in my feet. I am the mighty one who possesses the immortal fire. I am the truth that hates that evil is wrought in the world. I am the one who makes the lightning flash and the thunder roll. I am the one whose sweat is the heavy rain that falls to make the earth fertile. I am the one whose mouth is utterly aflame. I am the one who begets and destroys. I am the grace of the ion. Heart girt with a serpent is my name. It is popularly imagined that when Azathoth awakens, the world will end. The end of the world is often called the Apocalypse, and this word comes from the Greek apocalypsis, which means a revelation. This suggests to me that every time one world ends, a new one is revealed, and that every time something is revealed, a world ends. Perhaps when Abraxas awakens, all this will end, and something better will begin. Until next time. Thank you for watching, and be well.